Welcome back to everyone, our audience. We're grateful to have you here at Einstein's Eyes, John and I's YouTube channel. I'm an ophthalmologist, an oculoplastic specialist, and neuro-ophthalmologist. We trained at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I did my fellowship in Pittsburgh. I'm in Anchorage, Alaska. John Dickoff, my partner and friend uh, and co-resident at Einstein, mm -hmm. is here in New Jersey. John? Yeah, I'm actually in northern New Jersey. I'm a general ophthalmologist specializing in cornea. Been doing it now almost 30 years. Uh, miss uh, the great, great days at Albert Einstein, hence Einstein Eyes. And it's such an honor to be here tonight with Senator Holly Shapizzi. So I'll let Carl introduce her. Right. We are very grateful and honored to have Senator Holly Shapizzi from the 39th District in New Jersey. Holly is an attorney and she, on the committees of Community and Urban Affairs, the SCU Committee, as well as more relevant to this conversation is the Health and Human Services and Senior Citizens Committee, the SHH. Holly's gonna talk about some very important topics that as ophthalmologists, we don't really consider all that often during our journal club discussions or meetings with colleagues at various meetings, but policy, healthcare policy is so important. And Holly will be speaking, uh, Senator Shapizzi will be speaking about uh, mental health issues uh, and we'll touch on fentanyl as it relates to mental health issues. And we're really excited to hear her uh, discussion and conversation and uh, please, Senator, take it away. Thank you. And uh, it's an honor being on here with one of my constituents, Dr. John Dickoff. Uh, thank you for having me on tonight. Um, so just today, I actually introduced legislation in New Jersey on a topic that's very near and dear to me. Um, I think we've all seen across all professions, all age groups, all socioeconomic, um, as well as all states, a huge uptick in our mental health crisis as a result of the pandemic, as a result of kind of a lot of isolation that people felt, children being out of school, couple that with social media, couple it with a whole host of other things. And it's really become an epidemic of its own. Um, and as a result of, you know, one hearing anecdotally, two seeing people I love struggle and opening up to uh, people who I know about just uh, some things that we've faced personally, it made me realize how lacking our resources were in a state like New Jersey that prides itself on being at the forefront of trying to address mental health and substance abuse issues and a whole host of different categories with stigma-free initiatives, with expansion, of attempt at expansion of services to the population at large. But the one thing that I've seen firsthand is we have services for acute hospitalization, for those real crisis moments and voluntary um, hospitalizations as well as voluntary, but it really is just in an institutional setting, generally three or four days, uh, medically stabilized, and then released back out without the real sort of resources that people do need to learn how to live with their mental health illness, how to really kind of figure out what their triggers are, what made them get into that crisis moment to begin with, and how to get the skill sets, the tools, and the therapy alongside their medication to really be able to live and to not have this re repetitive type of in and out of an institution. And looking around at New Jersey, I recognized how few what beds are available, and beds are almost always in a hospital type of setting as opposed to more of a residential setting. 
We do have beds available for primary substance abuse disorders, but very few beds available for primary mental health disorders. And as everybody watching this knows, particularly if you're in the medical field, oftentimes the two go hand in hand, but you very often will have somebody that may just be self-medicating due to a mental health thing and may not actually have a substance abuse disorder that are being treated for a primary substance abuse disorder, but not really the mental health aspect of it. And so my legislation is looking to fill that void and that gap between just traditional IOP and traditional hospitalization for stabilization and really from a regulatory perspective, making it easier where providers don't have to go in and get approval and get a certificate of need as if they were a hospital and be able to do a transitional residential program, primarily for mental health that will enable people who don't have to have that or have already been stabilized to be able to come out in more of a residential setting to readjust and to have group therapy, to have it, the you know on-site services that are needed to recover and learn how to, through an intensive residential program, come out and reintegrate into society with all the resources that are required and needed. That's fantastic, really important. John, how does that affect your community? How do how do you see that? I mean, there's, yeah, there's a few excellent points that uh, Senator Shapizi is making, which is, I think one of the, as a physician, what we see on a regular basis is this group of people that have been forgotten. Uh, mental health is is it, it's not it's not a money maker for the pharmaceutical industry the way it should be, the way other things are, but more importantly. Physicians themselves, the reimbursement for a psychiatrist, psychologist is well below all of the other professions. And a lot of them don't take insurance. A lot of them, if they do take insurance, they delegate, they don't have the time or the energy to take care of these sick people. Um, and when someone's ill, whether it be from mental health or anything else, they need care and they need their insurance company to pay for it and find providers that will, re that will accept them. And that's a real big problem. And I think what, what the center is bringing out is that it, it's just a system that needs to be looked at. And it's a system that unfortunately is not working the way we all envision. So I, what she's bringing out is, is, a, is a great thing. I didn't know about the bill until just now. Uh, it's, it's, it sounds like a great idea. Hopefully it'll have bipartisan support. Um, I would hope so. So, I mean, it's great. And I, you know, I think, one of the other things I would just say is um, it's really an honor to have Senator Shapizi on here. We, we've worked together over many years. Um, she's in the trenches. I mean, she gets into our town and does anything she can to help us. So I see that now she sees that this is a community problem and she's right, you know, she's right in the forefront of it. Right, right, right. Um, you know, Senator, just from, from my uh, location, which is Alaska, there's a continuum of mental health and it touches on all the communities that, that exist within the healthcare space up here, which is the private community, the military community, the native community. And, you know, substance abuse is part of that, which is a very big problem. Uh, homelessness is a very big problem, which is also tied into mental health. But to that degree, can you just touch on the fentanyl aspect of this uh this so, concern the fentanyl aspect um i also am just introducing a bill in new jersey as well that is based upon the real life story of one of my constituents his 25 year old son max uh he actually died on his 25th birthday and he struggled with anxiety depression um, would self-medicate on occasion on his birthday. Um, he took a counterfeit uh, Xanax and 
didn't know at the time, uh, smoked some pot, took a counterfeit Xanax. The Xanax was loaded with fentanyl and he ended up ODing and dying mm -hmm. on his 25th birthday. And so his mom in her grief decided to try to channel some of that grief and bring awareness um, to a problem that even I, as a mother of a 20 year old college student, didn't understand how pervasive and prevalent the issue is right now. When people mm -hmm. think about fentanyl overdoses, oftentimes they think about, as you said, the homeless person in the street shooting up heroin. <laughs> um, the crisis has expanded far, far beyond that, where a very large portion of drugs that are on college campuses today happen to be pills. And kids who may not be taking or using heroin or cocaine uh, because they believe it to be um, pharmaceuticals that are prescribed, that it's okay to share Xanax and Valium and Adderall and a whole host of other um, pharmaceuticals, not realizing that a super majority of the pharmaceuticals that they are sharing on campuses right now to kind of self-medicate for their own anxiety, depression, and stuff that they're feeling are actually counterfeit pills that are flooding over the border, are coming in, being manufactured in China, are coming through uh, our southern border, and are being cut where over 70% of them contain some level of fentanyl. And, you know, so you have a lot of initiatives where colleges, sororities, fraternities are now passing out fentanyl strips and teaching kids how to utilize them. Well, fentanyl strips on a pill don't necessarily work because you'd have to test the entire pill. And it's a much different type of um, problem than what we've historically seen. So a lot of this is going to be about education, and the bill that I'm introducing on this would actually would be the sixth um, state in the country to mandate, mandate in health classes a specific kind of module on fentanyl poisoning, what it's currently in, how to differentiate between, you know, what are actual prescribed drugs, how, you know, what the risks are in taking something, even from your best friend. And if it doesn't come directly from your own pharmacy, um, kids are going on spring break to places like Mexico, DR, all these different countries where they can stroll into a pharmacy, they can stroll into a store and buy stuff off the shelves and think that they're bringing it home and, hey, I bought it off the shelf. So many of those off the shelf drugs that they're purchasing in these tourist hotspots actually contain fentanyl. And you know, it, we're finding that a much greater percentage of people who are starting to die from fentanyl poisoning are actually dying from drugs that would ordinarily be prescribed for things like anxiety and depression, yeah. as opposed to, you know, <clears throat> it's just going out to have fun or, you know, experiment with some sort of drug. So it is all tied into one another. Um, we see that uh, particularly in the age groups right now of 18 to 23, 24, um, a lot of kids are suffering from either PTSD, anxiety, depression, and are going to these sources rather than actually being properly evaluated and medicated if they need to be, and are just self-medicating, thinking, oh, I got to suck it up, or, oh, there aren't resources. You go to a college campus, you try to make an appointment for mental health, you're right. being put on a wait list where you're being told it's three months out. And that three month period is a semester that's over. And a kid who you know may go to these alternate things 
to try to get themselves through as they're awaiting the help that they actually desperately need. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that nails it. it. It's it's really a problem where you have some parents, you know, wonderful parents go into denial, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then you have children, whether they be 18 or 23, that are in denial. Um, and then even if they accept that they truly have a, a health problem where they really need help, then they finally want the help and they don't have access. Right. So there's a, so it's, it's very simple to just, hey, you know, I heard this thing relaxes me. Let's try this. And before you know it, they're doing something that it, it's not really productive. It's actually more destructive. Right, and I right. think towards that, we really need to start you know, encouraging more states to enter into interstate compacts, to allow telehealth, to allow mm -hmm. particularly in this uh, for psychologists, for uh, psychiatrists to be able to follow the patient, follow the student, and to have more access for those kind of instances. During the pandemic, we did allow for that. A lot of states, it was a temporary stopgap, and now have reverted back to no. You know, if you live in New Jersey and you see a therapist over Christmas, and then you move back down to North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina to go back to college, you know, you're being told by your therapist, I'm sorry, but I can't prescribe, I can't follow you, um, I could lose my license. And We've got to start kind of thinking a little bit outside the box and affording some sort of flexibility for those sort of situations, while also you know really doing an all-out education campaign starting in middle school into high school as to you know the dangers of, and it's not just fentanyl anymore. Now you have xylazine, which is even worse than fentanyl. You have all of these different things that keep getting kind of utilize that uh, may be used for you know, veterinary medicine and are, are now being cut into a whole host of different things and are having really significant fatal results for people. Yeah. Well, certainly interstate licensing is uh, a huge policy issue. And states' rights and state scope of practice plays into that. Uh, the other point I wanted to address John, you bring up access. I see artificial intelligence serving that role where you have a large language model and, and giant data sets that actually accumulate enough information to be emotionally appropriate and able to deal with these issues so that there is not a three-month wait list. Yeah, that might help. So, you know, AI is really exploding uh, with ChatGPT. I mean, I think it's almost represents a pivotal place in history in human development, sort of like the iPhone. So I'm waiting to see what happens with that and how it how it affects um, medicine in general. But I, I do think it has a role to play here, uh, particularly if there's someone in crisis, crisis management, and if they can't find someone to help them dial it down or to calibrate or to recalibrate and get treatment or at least get assessed with a plan, a management plan, AI could serve a role. Uh, Senator, have you thought about that at all or is that something that's new? Uh, the AI portion, I quite candidly have not. Um, I'll be candid while I think AI has, you know, an absolute role in our future. It also somewhat scares me, um, mm -hmm. you know, with respect to you have some of the people who have been an integral part of creating and doing it saying, you know, we've got to kind of slow roll this and we may have jumped too far ahead of ourselves uh, for some of the implications. And I do think that, um, you know, as we move forward, particularly in medical fields, we have to have very robust um, oh, yeah. ethical parameters around how we utilize it, to what extent we utilize it, and ensuring that the proper checks and measures are in place as well around it. Um, if you have 
rogue AI or you know something that really doesn't have very strict parameters around it. Um, I'm I'm just always part of the view of unintended consequences, and uh, that's been my motto both as an attorney as well as a member of the legislature. And right, going, right, right, um, right sometimes we get a little too far ahead of ourselves. And once we're there, it's really tough to kind of rein it in and bring it back. Right. Yeah, Carl, Carl, just to give you an example of, it's, it's, it's a different thing, but telemedicine, Senator Shapizi and I, along with uh, another person, who, the bill that was introduced really was a, kind of similar in that telemedicine came out like gangbusters during COVID. It really, I mean, it was out for many years, but it really exploded. But there wasn't a lot of, a lot of things were going on that are really kind of dangerous. And that's yeah, one of yeah. the reasons she introduced the bill. So it's the same right. idea. It's It's got to be really rolled out slowly and there's got to be a lot of control over it. But I do see a role because it's really about access. So I think anything we can do, but I, I don't know the numbers and I'm, I'm curious, maybe you guys know, but I mean, the way the budget is, you know, our federal budget, our state budget, and towards healthcare, I mean, I see as an ophthalmologist, I mean, how much money is going into, for example, injections for macular degeneration? It's costing, it's costing our federal government a fortune, and it's well worth it. I mean, you're you're preserving people's vision that are you know 80 years old that otherwise would have lost their vision. But I feel like the 23 year old that needs access to mental health care, they're being forgotten. So I think that needs to really be looked at. Right. And right. unfortunately, it, it's not viewed. And it needs to be viewed as just as important as oh, yeah. cancer research, just as important as you know wound care, or just as important as anything that we do that has to do with physical, you can see it medicine. Um, and I think that there has been for way too long a period, a, a, a an inherent bias against mental health being Great. equivalent to physical health, and they're so intertwined. Yeah. Right, right. No, certainly, uh, you don't want a program to get sketchy or dodgy with with patients, but we don't want a howl like from two thousand one. You know, right. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. So, no. fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I get your point. Um, you know, telemedicine in Alaska, at least from the, the community I exist in, really didn't take off because, you know, you get an 80 year old and they, they can barely use the TV remote. So they're, they're, they're just, it's impossible for them to figure out how to, you know, turn on Zoom or Teams or, you know, Google Meet. Um, so we were always on the phone with those folks. And in ophthalmology, is a visual specialty uh, with peripherals to, look inside the retina and look at the optic nerve or, you know, the big three, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, you need peripherals to see inside the eye. It was just, it was just, uh, it's just not practical. That's what we learned. But with um, other, with other specialties, it definitely exploded. I mean, including mental health. I mean, it, de it definitely exploded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Carl, I'll make you laugh. During the pandemic, we realized that probably half of the legislature had no idea how to use Zoom or <laughs> or any of that stuff as well and it it actually created some very comical moments for our um meeting right. along right. the way well that's not but, a bad thing but <laughs> they learned how to use it <laughs> yeah yeah so so i do think though that the interface is is really critical to designing it so it's effective for for folks and folks can figure it out um but again and and that's we'll see where ai goes but you know i'm an optimist um I think what you've talked about is is critical, um, has far and and wide uh, scope, affects our kids, uh, it affects our patients, it affects our community. So, in order to you know make all the pieces work more efficiently and effectively, we do need good policy and good understanding of how these things work. Uh, from the federal side, from the state side. Uh, I'm impressed, Senator. I commend you on your work. John, I commend you on your work as well. And uh, so I look forward to publishing the, publishing this and getting the, getting this out for our audience. 
Senator, I thank you. Uh, John, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, that was great, great, uh, great talk. Yeah. Senator, anything else you want to add before I wrap this up? No, just thank you uh, for having me. We appreciate Senator Holly Shapizi from New Jersey. Uh, perhaps we can have you back on the channel for another interesting topic or a follow up to see how the bill, what committees it went through, some of the ob objections, uh, some of the, the you know, uh, just, just how it went through the whole process. That would be really interesting as well. I would love that. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.